Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start. Um, I, I put up this picture. Um, it's actually not advertising. I would have brought it much more to the point. This is our legacy system. They are about, I don't know exactly, I think six or seven years old. They are ARM5. They have, um, this particular has one gigabyte of RAM and 64 megabyte of flash. So they're rather limited devices. Uh, we have a kernel that was never changed since these devices have been produced. So it's probably not a surprise that they have security issues. And um, nowadays, we want to put them 24-7 to the internet. So this is definitely a problem to us. So we had to come up with a solution to provide a kernel quickly and um, extend, also think about how we could upgrade in a safe way. <coughs> uh, yeah, one more thing is, as you can see, this is a, a fuse box that you have in your room. And uh, these devices are not easy accessible. So as an end user, it's not easy to actually swap devices one for the other. And if uh, one of the devices fail, we cannot just ask end users to do this on themselves. This is kind of a, it's an illustration for a physical, physical barrier we have. So and some of the decisions that we present are actually based on that we don't want to lose a device. OK. so. Um, this is not like uh, prior work. I just realized that there are a lot of talks, a lot of uh, talks also about software upgrading. I think there will be other tasks um, also concerned with it. But this is um, like basically what I think how software update has been done, and a little bit also based on real events. So the, the first thing is you have an image, and the image contains a kernel and an init RAM of disk. And at the end, you have the actual root FS. So you download it within your application image. And then you just KXAC onto the update. And then within the update, you don't need your actual root FS anymore. It's, it's unmounted. You're just running from ROM. And the init RD then just takes the payload, the new image, and flashes over the old one, which is quite an elegant way to do it. But of course, you have to risk that if you lose power, then your old rootfs is gone, and because of your RAM is gone as well, you basically have uh, bricked your device. So there is a, a fallback mechanism. You either push a button, or if, in case there is no rootfs available, it will automatically look for one in your USB stick. Uh, second solution. Uh, the, the first one is what we actually use till today. It's rolling update. It's what you know from regular desktop distributions, like uh, Debian testing or unstable, where you actually never really reinstall. You just keep going. And <clears throat> it has the advantage that you don't have to erase the rootfs and write it from scratch. You only ever switch small parts of it. Like if you compare it to a car, it's like you change the oil or change tires, change fuel pumps. There is a problem if you go for a long time and you ever do some kind of a legacy, like you move location of files, you have to carry this along with you all the time because you never know where your end users, end users really start off. And this also means there are a lot of upgrade paths that you have to consider. And in fact, you probably cannot ever test them all. And if you do more underlying changes, then um, this is very hard to do if you go with package-based updates. Like if you do, for instance, O package, it's probably not used in that way as we use it, and we had lots of troubles with it. So D package might be the better option, but to switch from O package to D package in the rolling system is like, I, I wouldn't do that. The next one is what I've seen, maybe in Android, it's done that way, that you uh, have a special U-boot. You download your image into a spare partition, and then through some mechanism from mailbox, you tell the U-boot that there is a root FS and it should actually upgrade it. So this is a pretty elegant one. You might end up that you have to, well, you're dependent on U-boot actually. So you might be able to do this with boot scripts, if you're familiar with boot scripts, so that it's not actually part of the U-boot. 
itself, but it's outside. But it might be that at the end you have to change it. And one more thing. Yes, it could happen that the root of asset you downloaded into partition gets uh, corrupted uh, through, well, it's, it's a rather extreme case, but uh, nowadays you have uh, flash translation layers, and it might be that when you write the root of S, it might be that a uh, few blocks get reshuffled, and that might corrupt your root of S. Um, it might be remote, but it's not under your control, and we actually have a device that just returned to us, and it came back with, like, uh, the kernel corrupted, and nobody's ever touching the kernel. As I said, we, we are very conservative in that, so either some of the users corrupted the kernel, I don't think so, or it's really a flash translation layer issue that happened. So if you lose your root of S, then you only are back with the U boot, and you have no way to get a new, a new upgrade. Maybe you can do a backup with the USB stick. Um, yeah. Well, in that particular picture that I showed you here, I cannot enter a USB stick either. You have to have a special form factor. It's not a standard one. So, <clears throat> so what is danger when you actually update it? Well, for us, it's mm, power fail. So if in, in the process of, of writing, you lose power and you don't complete it, but you already have destroyed it, that's uh, the dangerous part. And we cannot control this. It's something that uh, we cannot wear, but even, even the user, if he takes care, it might happen at some times. For instance, where I live, they never announce like service windows. They maybe announce it for hot water, but they never announce it for phone or for electricity. So if they actually have to do it, they should do it. And that might just happen from the outside. And of course, the risk is bigger if your update takes longer. <coughs> a good example is a U-boot. Like U-boot is very small, and it takes only a split second to actually write it. So the chance that you, that you actually break your device through a U-boot upgrade, I would think it's, it's rather small. Although people are typically very afraid of it, it's probably something that never ever fails, really. <clears throat> On the opposite, if you have a root of S that contains like megabytes or tens of megabytes, then it takes seconds. So the risk is just longer because it linearly increases. And the same thing is if you do a very lot of updates and if you update your reboot on every, every system upgrade, well then, of course, it might happen as well. Because, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so what we present here is, uh, yeah. It's not revolutionary. It's, we take uh, init RamFS, and we want to use KXAC on top of it. So why KXAC? We, we come to this later. But we want to have an init RamFS disk because we don't want to work on U-boot. We don't want to have our modifications. We don't want to modify the U-boot underlying it for several reasons. One of them is if you want to change something, we need to change the U-boot as well, So which is always like a single point of failure. The second thing is, we have different platforms, and none of them have the same U-boot. And it would be illusory from us to believe that we can have ever the chance to, when we get a new platform, to actually rebase U-boot so that they are all in sync, or actually change it. So we rather try to abstract the U-boot and add a layer on top, so we don't have to actually work with it. The next step is the logic to perform upgrades. So we come next. We come to the to the to our platforms, and some of them are very limited to do an upgrade. So the logic to do the upgrade is is, uh, is beyond scope what you'd like to do in U boot, and would take a long time to implement in it. So we rather go into a POSIX environment where we have all the tools that we know of, and the left thing, yeah, it's self stably upgradable. Yeah, that that will also be topic later. So these are our platforms that we have. They are like <laughs> 10 years back. It was like ARM5, 64 of RAM. The, the first one used to have an SD card, but that didn't turn out to be such a good decision. Uh, the SD cards start failing on us. So we basically assumed that these devices only have 256 megabytes of internal flash. Then there was the second try, which was like uh, improvement of it. We went back to a bigger internal flash. And the last one is the IMX6, where basically you don't have any limit by today's standard. I mean, these are just PCs without keyboard. And uh, the summary of it is, because of the partition, we cannot, we don't have a partition that we can download it 
in advance. We would have to repartition it, and so we have to come up with something else. Um, yes. So we go with the smallest denominator, which is the first one. The first one is 256 megabytes. We are not able to download the rootfs at all. So we have to download it on the fly and flash it on the fly. And it's not even able to hold it in the RAM because even the RAM is too small. So we came up with this uh, kind of pipeline, which is like uh, shell scripting on steroids. But it actually works. It's, uh, it, it proves that uh, this concept of um, small modules, like, like at the very beginning of, of Unix, still works today. It's was rather easy to implement this in a short time. So I guess I don't have to go through this. I think you can, you're familiar with pipelines. And I think I can demo it. Although the network just broke down on me before, so let's hope. So <clears throat> if you want to go uh, reflash request, we just place this kind of file onto a rootfs in a special folder. And the folder is uh, just standard Unix path. It's our lib rescue system. So if we just move, move it down there. and reboot. Yeah, I should keep talking something, just that it's not silent. So, yeah, we're missing swap off. We turned off busy box. And now it will get, this is a boot script that you see, and now there should be the prompt to enter the rescue system, which, yeah. I st interrupted normal boot up so to give more um, more output. So now we try to network because that was the problem before. Uh, just I don't know, it's like the demo effect. So, no. <laughs> yeah, waiting to get an administrator. No. And I start to get nervous. Oh, we're actually. Why well, it's not? Okay. Okay. So, and then I, I restart. This is the, the normal thing. If you get in, this will be the command that is run. And if I enter it, then it will mount the rootfs. And it says that it found the rootfs request. And it's seen the two links, and it will download these images. The first one was the signature, as you see. And now we start in the first, in the, in the first stream where we, where we do the verification. Well, why do we verify? Well, we haven't seen the image before. It might be that the server broke down, or that the, the, the signature is not valid. So we, don't, we cannot just start flashing immediately. Another issue is that for UBI of that volume, you actually need to know the size of the image. Because if you pass the burn command UBI update volume, you already need to know the size of it. So that's we do the, the word count in, in the pipe before. And then, well, yeah, we see a progress bar, and it's probably doing something. So I think we leave it there, and we just go back to, to the demo, and then check back later. So <clears throat> we're to the boot order. So we decided that we always boot into the rescue system first. And that was done for a simple reason that our devices are running like for days, weeks. We don't turn them off. So they might run for a long, long time. So if you would only ever enable it when you do an upgrade, which would not, not be on every reboot, then it might not be well tested. So we actually force people to use it all the time. That means we force it on ourselves, on our testers, and even on customers. So if there is a problem, we will see it. It's, it's merely a design decision. But <clears throat> you could, 
very well just disable it by removing the boot script, and then the UBIT will just mount the first partition, will not find the boot script, and roll over to the second one. So you could enable it just on whenever needed. Okay, but here we enable it all the time. It also comes back later when we do an upgrade. So if you want to upgrade the rescue system, we just remove the boot script first. Then we replace all the files. And once we are sure all the files are, are good and in place, we put it back. So that way we can actually um, <coughs> make a safe upgrade of the rescue system itself if we later come and want to add more features, and we do want. It can always boot just with the rootfs itself because it was used from the first day it was used that way. Uh, this is the, the logic that you've seen. And yes, it was resizing, so it's coming up. So <coughs> what you've seen when you come in, it mounts the rootfs. It checks for the special folder if there is a reflash request. If it is there, it goes reflashing. There is none, it will select the kernel. This is the, the second way we use it. We use it as a, as a, um, yeah, as a U-boot, as a bootloader itself, to actually do kernel upgrades without doing rootfs upgrades. And if there is no kernel present, well then, we have a default link that is built into the, the rescue system, and it will just reflash the rootfs from there. And if anything of that fails, it will reboot, and that thing starts over and over and over again until eventually we fix the server and the link becomes valid. So in that way, we hope this will be mm, not breakable in this way. So this is the upgrade way that I wanted to, to say. There is not much to say other than that. You would be able to start either way. So if you have currently no rescue system, you can go into the rootfs and then fix rescue from the rootfs. If you don't have the rootfs, you can go into the rescue system and the rescue will download another rootfs. So it's enough to have just one. So if you lost one, and you still have the other one, the system is not lost. So within the, the rootfs, when you downloaded the rootfs, the first thing it did, it updated the rescue system. So rescue system and rootfs are back in, in the same, uh, at the same point. So did you know that they both have the latest version that we ship? Okay, um, I probably will not demo that. Oh, actually I still do have time, but um, it might not be that interesting. But let's do it later if, if there is still time left. Uh, YK exec. Uh, as I told, we had the problem that the, the, our kernel was too old and we needed to update it as soon as possible. We're still up in rolling updates, so we could not do it in one step. So we did an intermediate step. We just shipped the new kernel using a package. So for those interested, we have packages for Yocto and we tried once to actually upstream it. So if there is still interest, even from, from other people and maybe from Yocto itself, We'll try again to actually uh, provide those. So <coughs> what it does, it will mount the rootfs, and we go to a special folder called slash boot slash entries, and figure out if there are some kernels that, uh, and pick the one with the highest priority. Um, we did not want to use it as a standard init RD, where you actually do a switch root or pivot root, and keep the kernel that you have in the rescue system. We wanted to keep those like uh, separate, so it's like it's artificial. You could still do it, and maybe for some systems it makes sense. But to the point now, we try to keep this as separate as possible. Actually, shrink the kernel in the rescue even more, and just make it dedicated to this single purpose. Even though it is Linux, and even though it could also run the rootfs, so it's just something we decided for now. Um. Okay. Uh, the, the kernel upgrades, that's again something we have taken from somewhere else. This is, uh, we've taken this from the, the bootloader specification, where they use um, drop-in files to do kernel upgrades. So that you, well, you don't want to have a big file where you just enter and modify it with set and awk. You want this to be generated. 
So there is such a, a folder. Ah, you know what? I just jumped in. So um, the form is, is a very simplified. The, the, the original bootloader specification is much more complicated, but we don't need that, not all that flexibility. So we just went with two simplifications. First one, priority is actually kernel version. Higher is better. We always want the highest one. The second one is, what we need to know is, where is the kernel and where is the DTB? And both is checksummed. So <coughs> if in the init drama fast, it just lists that, it checks if the files are there, it compares the checksum. If any of these things actually go wrong, it will just roll over to the next one. And hopefully, there will always be a next one. If there is none, then we reflash it. <laughs> OK, that's actually the same thing. That already showed. Okay. <laughs> I thought it will take much more time. Well, maybe it's a good time to for somebody to ask questions. Or I still have 28 minutes. So, is anybody? Does anybody have a question? Yes, there is a question. Yes, that's, that's the hard part. Like, yeah. Hard errors are easy. If you know, yes, it doesn't, no, it doesn't. That's easy. The hard problems are like um, this intermediate thing. Oh, sorry, the question was like, uh, what are you doing if your rootfs actually is? It's a valid X3, you can actually mount it, but when you try, you know, you hand it over to KXAC, you start booting. During the boot up process, some of the init scripts actually hang, fail for some reason. You cannot then SSH into it and fix the problem from remote. What are you doing then? Yeah. So we have been thinking about this, and there is a roadmap. And yes, it might be good that when you actually select a kernel, or if you, on the overall, should try to boot the rootfs, that you um, maybe touch a file in warlib rescue system, that you actually tried this already once before. And then during the init process, you should actually say, OK, this, this boot is confirmed. So that you don't are trapped in a loop where you ever and ever try the same thing to boot again. And also the same thing about kernels, because this is completely like extreme. You don't need this if you do rootfs upgrades with one kernel in it, because then you know that the, the rootfs with the kernel is good. It's hardly ever the case that you will add a new kernel without also changing the whole rootfs. Um, this is exactly this part is exactly great if you do small changes. Like if you want to add a new feature, you add a new kernel to it, and you do a little mistake, and then kernel can actually boot. You know, and you did this remote, and you don't have access to the console. Then this would be great that you actually verified that you tried this boot configuration, and it didn't. It didn't boot. So we will not try this custom modification for a second time. <laughs> Does this answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the that's the weak spot. Um, I never talk about the root of S and the configuration. That's something I, and that's actually the reason why we didn't switch to rootfs. OK, the, the question here was like, uh, where do you store uh, device-specific configuration, like user configuration, all the important data that you have, like statistics. We collect a lot of statistics about uh, how noisy is your power line, so that we know if you have to switch in different modulation modes. So there's a lot of data. But I don't do this in here. I treat this as part of the rootfs. So the rootfs has to make um, like periodic updates. And it is the rootfs that actually triggers a reflash, so it is in full control. So the fact is, there is this partition that we have, and um, yeah, we store it there. And then during boot up of the first time, we restore that old configuration. OK. Uh, any other qu Yes, back there.
Okay. Uh, so repeat the question. Um, what if between verification and actual burning, the, something on the server has changed? So for instance, somebody changed the root FS, or what would you do? Well, I, I ask back, what would you do in that case? There is little you can do. I mean, if somebody takes over the server, what you definitely will not do is we will we'll abort flashing. We will like corrupt the root FS, and now it's a, it's a brick device. And whenever you apply power, it will continue to try if the server now has a valid update or not. And if an attacker is able to actually fake the signature, well, then you lost anyway. Yes. Does this second run of course. Anything, yes. Okay, so the first run downloads. The first run might download a completely different image, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So it verifies the another image. And then somebody has just a server set up that for the first Yes, and for the second it gives another one. Uh, yes, but they download the signature only one. Yes, that's right. But you see that the GPG runs also on the second run, and they download the signature only once, and the same for the checksum. So uh, the second run has to, to match the GPG and the SHA-SUM. So if this happens, something actually takes over the server, we will detect it, and we invalidate the root FS. So in that, that's the safest thing you can do. And then you just keep trying, trying, trying. Eventually, we will figure it out and fix the server. So OK, any other questions? Otherwise, I continue with the unit tests. Because uh, although most people think these are the least important, they actually are, in this project, um, it's very annoying to do it. Because you have to build the init drum FS, you have to copy it on the system, then you have to, you have to boot, and it's only in the drum FS. Any change you do is lost on the next boot. So it is very time consuming. And having good unit tests really speeds up the, the programming. Um, I can I can show you just the. Uh, I will show the. Um, where is my mouse here? So um, yeah. So uh, it's a lot of unit tests. I just want to show we really take this serious. So <laughs> I think it's like I don't know, and. Um, we test, actually, we, we start by, my, by writing the test, and then we start to add the functionality, because it's too cumbersome to develop it on the target itself. So the way that the testing works, or that we do the testing, um, is since it's only shell scripts, and it's not really a C program, even a C program, it might be difficult to do, uh, we actually use a, a, root, of a, a root shell uh, that we mock up. So the, the, boot, the boot program itself does very little. It does everything underneath of standard Unix commands. And the most of the important of them is like wget and mount. And if you're able to kind of mock up those, then your actual boot logic can run on top of those. It will not notice it. So yeah. And then you, what you actually do is all of these mocked up versions just emit all the commands, including all the flags. And then you capture those and keep it uh, in a safe place. It's, it's what you expect a good run should look like. And um, every test that you've seen before, it just exactly this. It just creates uh, this kind of uh, fake, fake sysroot. Uh, it goes into this folder and then runs our boot system command that you've seen before. And it produces a run. We take that run and compare it to you. If it's the same thing, it probably nothing has changed. You didn't break anything serious. And for the most time, well, actually, I can't remember a case where we actually failed on it, on the system. What you still have to do is, you're using BusyBox, so it might be that you need to enable special, special commands, and not all the flags are supported as you expect on a desktop. But other than that, this was very convenient to do. Um, I could go on with that. But let's 
I still have 20 minutes, wow. Okay, um, it's funny to tap over without, uh, here we go. So, and then it will just continue, and of course it should produce an error. There it is. And then I can go in and fix it. That's actually how development happens, and it's very, it's very convenient. It's that's what you know. You know it like the right side of your pocket. It's just shell scripting. That's what you, what you do all the time. And as I the man, it's more comfortable to do this than actually extend U-boot. You're much faster. Also, it's just shell script. Is there any question to this? No more questions. Um, in the second run, you destroy the root FS. So if the, the signature doesn't match, it's better to find it out in the first run, because then you didn't destroy the root FS. And the minor reason is that something like UB update volume needs to know the size of the image. So you need to download it to actually know how big it is, so you can pass it to the uh, UBI update volume. So I think the first run is very much needed. Also because you just want to rule out to take uh, a, a, an image that is corrupted, because that way you could exactly do what you expected. You could make a denial, well, you could destroy a device, just somehow just uh, tricking the servers. With a f even if the, if the thing is wrong, you could uh, just take away the, server fr the service from the user, which is an attack itself. Okay. So, will be a short break. Uh, okay, so that was the demo. Um, yeah, uh, these are the resources. So currently there is not much documentation. So it's probably mostly this demo. And we have some wiki about uh, how to use it. And of course there is the repository that we have. And there are also Yocto recipes, how we use it, like how we wrap up the whole thing. And you might want to look also in the rootfs, there is also a folder rescue system where you can just generate those tools easily. And yeah, okay. So this is what we like to have for next time. And the first thing that we try to avoid is having two runs. So, well, this is for the, the smallest system that we have that doesn't even have enough RAM to, to keep it in, in memory. Already the second one, which is UBI, already is like on the brink that it can keep it in RAM. So we want to extend the pipeline so that it also keeps it in, in a RAM disk. And if that still verifies at the end of the first run, we rather take that than moving the second one. And that one then can later extend it that if the root FS already is big enough that it can hold the update, then we take it and copy it into RAM disk and start from there. So there is no streaming necessary at all. And there is like a, a dynamic fallover between the, between the different uh, platforms. Then there is the handshake that has been asked before. So this is exactly for things that are only half broken, not fully broken. But it's also a question how you want to actually define if something really worked well. Is it if the SSH is working or if you have a HTTP? What, what, what defines that it really works? And yes, there is space optimization. I haven't shown it, but um, I think it's about two or three megabytes. Well, the, mo the biggest part is actually libc, and then it's uh, gpt. Um, yeah. Yeah, I still have. Yes, so it's three megabyte is the uh, is the image drama fs and the kernel we didn't tune the kernel. The kernel is actually much bigger than the image drama itself. 
And now we can go into the rescue. And then I can just show the biggest, biggest issue there. So <laughs> any more questions? Yeah. Let me just hit the, the front. Uh, yes. Ah, doesn't. Oh. No, so it will not work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, your question. Do you what do you mean? Okay, that's a very good point. <laughs> yes, you got me there. <laughs> uh, no, we don't. That's that's true. That's a, a good question. Are you having a talk later on? No. Uh, okay. Yes, that's true. So very good. Uh, so if you go back to the, this here, uh, you see that we do the GPG. We we take it from the VGAT. But if down here in the UV update something goes wrong, if it goes wrong, that's perfect because then we have the error code and we say, like, "Ooh, something went wrong." But we, what we don't do is we run, like, read it back through, maybe cat it and then f like cut it off so that you have the right size and then feed that back to GPG to actually verify that what you wrote is what you want. No, we don't do that. That's, yeah, good catch. We, which come back actually, whether we verify that the boot actually works. If that actually works, we would drop back into the shell for the next time and try again. But, uh, well, does it make sense to try again? <laughs> There's very little you can do. Well, if you expand it, at some point you end up with the halting problem, which is unsolvable. Oh, checksums over the whole device. Yes, I, I know tripwire and embedded. It will probably delay the boot process. Just once. Okay. Do you mean you have a list of good checksums of every binary you have on the root FS and actually compare if those really match? And how would that be different if I just take the raw device, read back the raw device, and check some there? It's probably the same. Uh, okay. <laughs> we actually we have we expanded later, but we already go into development. Is there anybody else want to have a question? So I will finish just the roadmap. Uh, So the, yeah, roadmap. Uh, yes, yeah, so we still have patches to Yocto. Is there anybody from Yocto in here? Nobody. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we tried to add multi-kernel support into Yocto, and it seems like Yocto at, at well, not at the core, but maybe it's just an assumption there is only ever one kernel inside. So a lot of a lot of paths for the kernel source are actually hard coded, and I had a hard time to to expand it to compile two kernels in Yocto. And I have these patches, and I try to mainline it, but it seems like there is not really that much interest in, in having two kernels produced with Yocto, maybe because it's such a remote feature. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, you would be interested. OK. Um, what's, what's else? Uh, yeah, communicate the errors back. So if the GPG failed or if the checksum failed, you probably want to give back to rootfs some kind of feedback so that they can make a nice use, user interface out of it. We are uh, working on that. but. Uh, well, it could definitely be better. And now that I still have 10 minutes time, I thought there was something more. But, um, pardon, I get closer. So, uh, 
Okay, you go for the unit test. Um, yes, I looked at uh, Drakut, which is using um, which is using a KVM and KUNIT as fallbacks for it. Yes, it's something something nice to have, but how would you actually make a fake mount or a failed VGET? At some point, you have to force it into errors. It's nice to have it like a KVM or a QMU. Like, it's definitely better than that. Well, this is just change, uh, change root. It's even worse than that. We're not even using change root because we don't copy all the desktop over it. We just prepend every path with like this, or we overwrite the path that we take our utilities first and then use the system utilities. So that one would make it like more real, like more close to what you actually have. But I was thinking about how I could uh, force it into all these error cases, like we get fails on the first, fails on the second, fails on the third, so it actually go through all the thing. It doesn't help me in that thing. One second. Uh, for those who don't hear, uh, the question was like, uh, have you ever planned to extend the unit test so that we use a, a real uh, key MU or KVM so that we really run in, in uh, emulation? And yeah, my answer, you, you heard it. Okay, so your next question. Okay, S yes, so the question was like, so I could also inject errors on the KVM layer, but I'm not sure how I could do that. I, it sounds to me like I would start to write kernel modules just to make the testing. So there is some support in QME that they could automate this, or there is already a mechanism in place that it can, yes. So you're familiar with it? So maybe you can have a, a chat later on. I was thinking about going to QMU and KVM, but then I thought like, well, it's, it's something that's a lot of effort to do. In the end, I didn't really see the benefit of doing it because this is just shell script and I create a very, very crazy, uh, crazy pipeline. But other than that, it's, it's not, um, it doesn't give me any, any advantage. So I'd rather stick with which is really simple. And this is really simple and it's easy for everybody to understand and work and set up, because you don't have to set up. You just go in there, you type run scripts. There you go. Yeah. OK, uh, more questions? Yeah, back there. OK, so can you repeat the question, please? Do you also encrypt the root Oh, do I also encrypt the root FS? Who? Uh, I think I know where you're heading, it's like about key management. So the question was like, do we also encrypt the rootfs? And no, we don't. The rootfs is unencrypted on it. And um, yes, encryption. And it is not signed as well. The rootfs? Yeah. Well, it is signed. Well, the image is signed. Yeah, the image is signed, but once it is on your device, yes. and the attacker is able to access your device, you can do whatever you want. Well, if an attacker ever gets root, he can do what he wants anyway but you mean that he can modify the root FS so that it even survives the reboot. So, yeah. Um, well, no, we don't do it. Um, I haven't done a really security like uh, estimate, and I'm not sure that this is the most probable attack to do it. Because um, if you are able to actually modify, uh, do modification of the root FS, as you've seen, it's very easy also to modify the, the rescue system. So you can actually hide yourself inside of the rescue system and actually do some things on top of there. So even if you verified it, or you can turn off the verification. So I, how you want to protect it? You would, you would have to start actually from the chip. Then you'd have a secure, a secure bootloader, and then you have to go into secure rootfs so that you can actually just rule out that anybody who ever had rootfs will not modify anything in the path. Yeah, but that means, okay, so every component needs to be signed so that you can actually trust, you can pass the trust from the first to the second component. Well, what you have to start with the chip. So when the chip comes out, they have to start in secure mode. And then your U-boot has to be secure, and then rescue has to be secure. So 
it's not something uh, we expect, or it's not our goal to really close it down as much. But uh, yeah, that would be a lot of effort to actually do that. And especially since we have several platforms, we'd have to do it on each of them individually. Um, yes, we actually do GPG upgrades. Oh, question. Okay. You mean on the fly, transparently? Yeah. Okay, um, there was a note. Uh, what was the name of it? Um, it's called uh, Integrity Measurement Architecture. Okay, uh, just a, not a question, but a remark. So there is a, a integrity measurement uh, infrastructure in Linux, which does it on the fly. So it seems like it, whenever it sees the first file, it, continue, it computes a checksum, and then whenever that changes, it will kind of uh, raise a flag, something went wrong, or something changed. So if one of your executables changed? Yes. Hmm, okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm advertising for you talk. When is your talk tomorrow? It's 1400. So there is a talk about uh, transparent security measurements. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we can close it here, unless somebody else wants to ask something. Yes. Uh, no, uh, file system, that's probably uh, the independent fight. No other reason that we used to it. It's not really. What would you sp propose? Um, not, with, not with X3, but as I told you, we before had a problem with the raw kernel in the flash. So we had problems with it, but not with X3. But um, we're not using that platform so long, so that might be another topic. But with this, it's actually easy to, to swap file systems. As you've seen, the first platform still uses JFS2, which is, together with the limited ROM, it should, it's very bad. We should actually switch over to UBI. And with this, we can do. So if you have today X3, tomorrow we can have riser. No, not riser, but BudRefS, probably. Or what would you suppose? Yeah. BudRefS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other question? No. I have, uh, I could go into our security. So we, we have um, the, the key that is inside of the rescue system. Uh, there is a key rotation. You, you need to think about how to do a key rotation. And um, that's actually a tricky thing if you, if you go back in this kind of trust model. It's a, it's a dangerous thing to do. And uh, we actually sidestep that. And we're using, oh, I don't have it with me. So we're just using a secure token card. And then we, we plan to. We don't actually have it yet. But we put it in place. So if you actually sign it with a secure card, that should avoid to have too many key rotations. But we're still able to do key rotation because we can switch to rescue system. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Enjoy.